So we'll start with the title poem from the translation of Drink of Red Mirror. Um, there was a lot of drama concerning how to translate the title. Uh, the literal translation would be a glass of red mirror, but then people would think we were talking about like a wall mirror rather than a glass of wine. So for a long time, it was a cup of red mirror, and it still is in the table of contents because we didn't proofread this well enough. <laughs> but, um, the, our editors changed it to a drink of red mirror, so that's what it is now. <laughs> we have to live with it. A drink of red mirror. After I dream of you, I get chills, a fever, the night street with the lights out and all the windows, nobody moving. Only the store signs glimmer their lit letters, but inside you, there's no shelter for me. This must still be inside that mirror name for you. I can't move a step. It turns out solitude is a mirror, first reflecting, then expelling. It's a red thing. It's wine. From far outside my body, a headache approaches throbbing, and I get chills in the summer night, a fever. This street doesn't even smell of the warm interior. How much warmer must I get to withstand the cold inside the mirror? There, that lightning bolt attached to the tail of a scream. That lightning's inside your head, it can't leave. Inside you, there's only you, nobody else, as always. You spat out so many of me. But I see only inside, but I see me only inside you. I see me shivering all over. Somewhere the sound of a hammer striking the side of a head. The gunshot of solitude ringing in the night street. Now I don't even have the room to breathe. I gaze at the red glass, its calm surface. I lift that red mirror and drink it. The mirrors running red inside my body shout. You leave the bar and stagger away somewhere far, but that far place is the closest place to me. Inside me, there's nowhere to run away from you. All right, I'm reading one called Eurydice in print. No, Eurydice trapped in print. Is this good? Um, all right. I think the hardest part about translating this one was figuring out pinking shears in Korean. That was a tough word. <laughs> um, we, had to, we had to call Kim A. Soon on, I think. Um, okay, Eurydice trapped in print. Um, if a tear does not come out, do you know what happened? The tear goes back inside and freezes me. Like a body on a snowy night. There must be a prison inside my body which fits me just so. After waking from sleep, a cry escapes the prison of my throat, but my lips are frozen shut. No scream falls from my lips. At every sound, my thoughts stick together. They can't break free. My arm, my arm... My arm, my arm, arm, please move. My tongue must be hiding under a space heater, sweat dripping from my eaves freezes. Who drew the curtains then left? Every morning, a pupil bigger than the window rolls around my room. The body of a half-frozen bird falls across that pupil. Please let me be left for dead, free of this world free of this world, as if pinned by the needle of a phonograph. I am a fallen bird caught in the trap of I. My face flushes red and my body cages me like a glue huffing bag that is frozen shut. Help, help, doctor, teacher, help. Help me, Mr. Mortician, Mr. Clockmaker, Mr. Manager at the calendar factory. Help, ah, ah, please, for goodness sake, cut me out with your pinking shears. Free me from inside this print. I forgot the real toughie on that one was glue huffing bag. <laughs> we emailed, or Professor Shin emailed Kim soon about the glue huffing bag, and it was something crazily specific about finding like a plastic bag on a mountaintop that had been used to sniff glue, and we just we couldn't translate that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is face. Inside you, there is another you. The you inside you has a tight hold on your body. That's why your fingernails curl inward. The shell of your spiraling outer ear also gets sucked into your body. If the you inside you lets go of its tight hold on your hand, probably at that moment, you will not exist in this world. Your face solidifies into the same shape that the you inside you has pulled taut. That face sometimes leans out into my face outside you. 
I sense inside your two pupils the you inside you that peers out at me, but the you inside you has never let go of that tight hold on your hand. You are still pulled taut. Your face is deeply wrinkled from enduring that tension. And the you inside you is so strong that the I inside me is about to be pulled into you. You have now drunk a glass of red wine and hold the cheese in your hand. The I inside me is reminded that cheese is made of milk and that worries which cow inside a cow spewed out that milk. Even if you are far away, the you inside you is still here. I cannot send away or avoid the you inside you. Maybe I am the hostage of an absentee. While the I inside me has a tight hold on me, I too will remain alive. But even so, I want to dedicate to your table every morning the cheese made from the I inside me. Old Refrigerator Instead of my feet running to you first, I hold back. Instead of my lips going to yours first, I desperately hold back. Already I've passed decades holding back. It's strange to think about. It seems I've been holding back like this since I got my own refrigerator. Anyway, I keep thinking. My mind is crowded with ice. Anyone who touches my cold foot loses consciousness. <laughs> the lips of any person who enters my heart turn to ice. So I will not take even one step from here. I will not reach out my hand. Again, I tell myself not to forget about this. Nevertheless, I hold back so desperately that not even a leaf falls in my room and not even a bird kicks off from the ground to fly. I will endure the wind that desperately blows in with my fingers in a 22-volt socket. The frozen landscape, how beautiful. Lady ice of the frozen kingdom inside that landscape, how pure. I won't worry about the blood trickling down my thigh as it will soon freeze solid. Outside hot, inside cold. It's so cold it boils. When the door opens and the light is startled on, a winter landscape displaying frozen intestines, aloof for decades until the typhoon came. The blackout lasted for days and everything inside rotted away completely. Okay, um, the last one we'll read from, no, this is not the last one, sorry. I'll read Munich Chum. Munich Chum was um, a Korean who um, smuggled cotton seeds out of China to Korea. Um, China used to have a cotton monopoly. Um, Munich Chum. Nostalgic fashion, I want to wear it. My mother's flowered hanbok jacket and black skirt. When she went to teach the children, the black attendance book in her bosom. The dense pink flowers that bloomed out of my dawn sleep on her white poplin. The flowers that bloomed creeping over my diseased body. A thread of wind tangled in each bloom coughed, and the swarm of ants that never sleep, even in moonlight, itched inside each bone. From those itchy flowers, I'll make thread. I'll cover your bare body. A dress of plum or cotton blossoms, wet from night fluttering densely. I want to wear it. I'm glued in front of the closed shop window on Rue St. Paul on Sunday. When I keep staring into that pattern, it seems that from my heart, a nostalgic landscape will pour out to wash my body. Did Munich Chum think of this, hiding that flowering night landscape inside the cap of his writing brush, that he could weave a suit of clothes if he wrote all night with that brush, that with a blanket full of flowers, he could cover someone for a warm night's sleep? Did he think that? In the middle of walking down an unfamiliar road, I want to put on a flower dress. I want to take away those flower seeds inside the cap of the writing brush I stare at endlessly. If I put on that dress, you and I could, inside the dress, like souls in a spirit marriage, gaze far, far away. I stand bewitched by plum or cotton blossoms wet from night. Okay. And this is weather update, but this will be the last from um, Kimei Soon. So weather update. Summer is coming, the storm is powerful. When the street lamp is lit, two lilac trees are seen recklessly swaying. In my youth, why did I write that two lips stick to one another? <laughs> then get unstuck under the lilac tree. 
When two lips pile on top of another, you grow infinite. Grown infinite, you disappear. I wander here and there around the endless inside of your infinite body gathering you. In the darkness, I grasp your neck. Every time it's grasped, your leaves rustle and fall. I unearth your fingers. They glitter in the light. In the flower bed of darkness, I pick up the flurry of your falling leaves. I also endlessly pick up your many thousands of ears. Though I try and try, you can't be held entirely in my arms. You are a heart-throbbing infinity. Two lilac trees, each holding out thousands of hands, waver as they attempt to embrace. Ten horses have already raced by, but their hoofbeats still rumble atop the lilac trees, and the sound of the waves at night marches in from the East Sea to beat us. A broom made with tens of thousands of my gazes sweeps you up. Spatter, spatter, drops of blood fall like red beans. When you ask me, what are you thinking? I quickly pushed an earlobe dripping with blood between your lips and said, I'm not thinking of anything. Under the street lamp, two lilac trees recklessly tremble. Okay. Okay, I'll be reading a few poems from my book. Good English. One. When I am complimented on my English, I do not feel complimented. When a classmate marvels that my vocabulary includes special words like putrefaction, it is not a compliment. When the receptionist at the dentist tells me you don't have an accent because she doesn't know we both have accents, it is not a compliment. When someone who uses greengrocer's apostrophes doesn't know about the existence of the subjunctive in English and believes he has the right to judge what I say and write because he was born to our language says, your English is so good, the foreign tongue in my mouth twists. No, my English is fucking brilliant. <laughs> Two, the first English sentence I learned was, who are you? From a textbook written by Koreans translating literally, who didn't know that's not how polite English speakers identify each other. The first dictionary I memorized had a pink cover and an example sentence and illustration for each definition, e.g., she walks among the flowers, or among, accompanied by a drawing of a woman in a pink dress floating through tulips. The first English picture book I read was about a witch named Meg. The first English non-picture book I read was about a mermaid named Belinda. I do not remember my first dream in English, my first time blurting ouch instead of aya, the moment my plastic brain flipped a switch. Three, the pronunciation of my mother tongue is strange. This could be because English divides sounds into fewer syllables and or because English tongues live closer to the teeth. In truth, I am no longer capable of hearing my own strangeness. Four, when I moved to the United States, I failed the oral English placement test administered by my Texas school district because I could not add up how much money the numberless drawings of American coins represented, or in what season a holiday associated with the fat vulture-like bird is celebrated. I spent one day in ESOL before a written exam moved me into a mainstream class where I was taught to avoid should of and could of, phrases I had never known before. Five, in eighth grade, I was obsessed with the American Civil War and could draw from memory troop movements on each day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Sometimes I wish I had stuck with it so that I could have been the Asian lady historian who shows up at reenactments, <laughs> correcting men about their armament. Instead, I teach white teenagers Aristotle's means of persuasion, which I suppose is cognitively dissonant still for some of them. <laughs> Six, your English is so good, feels like being complimented on how well I breathe, feels like being catcalled, feels like being handed a plastic cup when everyone else has champagne flutes. Every time I toast with champagne, I want to clink my flute against someone else's so hard they both shatter into spangles on our feet. Every time someone begins, your English, my tongue melts in my mouth like rancid butter. I'm, get, I'm gonna read two short ones for Sue's Long. Um, I will bring them good. 
The roses laugh at the pavement with their wild yellow tongues while the neighborhood children catch nails in their feet. Do you remember when you caught me behind the transformer? I slapped you with a skinny branch I found on the ground, my left heel streaming blood, streaming rust. Your eyes were so sharp, they cut through every bit of cotton overlaid on my body, broke my branch. I was many tiny things that glittered and bit in the light and the water that surrounded me. When the cat died that summer, I took it as omen. Her body went missing not three days later, just a hole where a grave had been. Two of us who can't find rest. Should I ever see her bones again, I'll burn them good. And my body, that's no longer a body either. Well, let that know peace by fire too. You who might just catch. And the next short one is, is a love poem. I, I don't have no title, I just called it Love Poem. Um, in the summer, we drank sassafras tea and filled up on white bread. You took both with honey while I tied up the June bugs with string. You, who my eyes walked up and down in the dawn, the curve of your ear in abandoned railroad, the place where I still go to collect the buds of lost cigarettes. You, sleeping on your side. Hovering above the blankets, I learned to catch you in my mouth. Like a bee closed in the fold of a flower, you became a thing I could hold on my tongue. Something to take home after the early frost killed our hopes of wild plums and sticky fingers. You were a feeling I wanted to last, even as my chest throbbed with the heat of the summer. Even as the tens of thousands of windmills in the pasture of my mind all picked up speed at once. The body full of ache and the season echoing that ache. The clouds above the fields swollen in their desire to release. This is called The Beautiful Country. Um, it begins with a Korean word. Me, beauty. Not used by itself, but to form other Korean words such as mi in, beautiful person, mi su, fine art, mi kuk, the United States of America. No, really, Chinese does the same, mi guo. So, there are literally billions of people who have this association, USA, beautiful country, whether we like or believe it or not. I believe it sometimes, but in those moods, I believe it of the universe. At first, you don't know it the same way American children don't know the Latin roots of their words. I made a connection when I was eight, but it was meaningless then. America, you are so distant. You might as well have been Narnia. Okay, so usage transcends etymology, right? Like when we say someone's sinister, we're usually not maligning left-handedness. But the beautiful country is so plain and open. I mean, it's meaning. And every time someone complains in Korean about the American military presence or the hegemony of American media, the automatic translator in my brain whispers, beautiful country. It's seriously annoying, but what else can we say? <laughs> How else to sum up this place where I live and vote? I became a citizen, Ximin, literally city person, on October 10th, 2013. That was the year I graduated college from St. Louis, a year before Ferguson, a month before Jonathan Farrell, the year of Obama's second inauguration, Boston Marathon bombings, George Zimmerman's acquittal, Detroit bankruptcy, debt ceiling crisis. I knew what I was getting into. They made it unnavigably difficult too. They lost my paperwork. I complained it was like they were trying to dissuade me from citizenship. I could have moved back to Korea or emigrated someplace new, but I voluntarily committed myself to America. Sometimes I feel like I live in a suburb painted on top of a Roadrunner cartoon. Sometimes the mountain behind my house is a golem, awake but lazing in bed. Sometimes on the bus someone says something ugly to me, and I wonder if they would say the same thing or nothing if they knew I was, we were, citizens of the beautiful country. Sometimes someone demands to know what type of Asian I will, I am before they will speak to me. Sometimes I am greeted in the wrong Asian language, poorly pronounced, which feels less rude, even though it involves more assumptions. <laughs> Sometimes the beautiful people eat foreign words, first cautious italics, attempts at making the right vowel sounds, soon abandoned, 
And this used to bother me. Not anymore. Say it. I'm from Seoul. I'm a Miguk Shimin. Yeah, I want to make this one. <laughs> um, in Cambodia, so this, well, I think I should say I only got, got to Cambodia because the Piper Center. <laughs> Um, in Cambodia, um, I use my hands the same as how I use them at home. They put lotion on my skin, put food in my mouth, always go after me, clean my mess. They work without thought to meet the needs of this body, to protect the thing of it as best they can. At the temple, the Apsaras are using their hands too. They line the walls, dance across the tops of every threshold, as if they are doing the work of holding up the ruins with their curling palms, fingers set like birds, balancing what's left on the strength of their laughing hands, shy hands, sorrowful hands in motion. Those ruins, which are not really ruins, but a continuing, the roots of trees wind in and out, the people that come here to see the women carrying a temple on the tips of their fingers wind in and out too. And me, who want so hard to fit it all into my eyes, as the jungle, that massive green, is pushing in, pulsing at the edges all around. My hands take a picture. The women hold their pose. Later, I'll open my phone to see an image of women making impossible work look like a dance. The art and mystery of their hands. Women born from milk whose story is etched in stone on a temple wall. My hands holding it all, working to understand the job. Oh, what is this? this is the last one I'll read. It, I wrote it for um, the forms class. It's a Sestina. And um, I wanted to read it because I wrote it when we were like in the depths of translation of Kim Hye Soon, and um, her book, as you can tell, has a lot of like people within people in it. So I feel like I became obsessed with that idea, and I produced this poem, which um, I was obsessed with um, recursion at the time, which worked well for us as Tina. Cities and homunculi. I dreamt a city with the copy of itself in its center in perfect miniature. On Sundays, its citizens circumambulated around themselves, the replica dropping with its own strollers circling the streets of their city. It was a turtles all the way down city, an infinite series of identical copies differing only in size. My own perception sat on top of the perfect top layer, where they observed themselves condescendingly being top size citizens. Then I woke and saw that the citizens around me were also like the city, that they were infinitely folded themselves but not identical because their copies were inexact, increasingly imperfect. It looked as if they had put in flaws with their own hands. Then I examined my own body and found that I too was a citizen of the infinite city. With perfect economy, I was filled like the city. The membrane thick thinness of each copy allowed uncountable people fitting themselves into me, and of course each were themselves brimming with differences of their own. I heard my old voices from older copies, the non-rhotic and rhotic citizens spoke together. From a minute city, someone read the Pearl Poet and Perfect Mancunian. Several miles down, the perfect structure began to waver as the layers themselves saw they did not have to stay in their cities. They could fold up and investigate their own miniatures, refuse to stay on their levels, be citizens of other replicas. They began to engender copies, to perfect thoughts and lives of their own. Then they themselves dreamt they were citizens of an infinitely folded city in which walked their copies. And I'm also going to read a Sestina. Um, and it, uh, Sally was laughing earlier because I said, I like this form because I just really like repeating myself. <laughs> and it's true. Um, <laughs> all right. Again, no title. So when I saw it, the part of it left behind by the accident, pink thigh bitten through by lawnmower teeth in the front yard, bone exposed to air to hot night, I thought only of you, my desire reopening like a sore spot, a wound, more open than I thought a body could be. Though I couldn't name it mine or claim that pink knee lined with sharpness, with teeth, I wanted you in the midst of disaster. 
Me, who is just a bone-made thing, thin-skinned thing, filled with night, of thoughts of nights spent with you. The work of lawnmower or farm equipment to open the landscape is not lost on me, not lost on the land itself. Our kind, who has been made pained, made pink, made gone by worse, tacked on the fence by our teeth for another to stumble across dumbly in the bone white light of dawn. Still, bone beckoned, I go to you, at night I go. You, who kindly opened for me, as I open myself for the truth of it. The two of us, pink fed off our womanness, our sex that cuts its teeth on retribution, gnashes its teeth under the hand of punishment. Bone blank, bone done. You bend and cradle, you mimic night, who stretches, covers, breaks open into brightness again and again. It wants, it wants, this it of mine that keeps on even when you're in your pink sheets after. My heart, I never thought would take that color. Pink, the softest one, soft as baby's gums, baby's teeth, little thumb and little mouth at night, comforted, rested, not us. Still, I open, I reach for you. Whatever it is you've raised up there, pink stalk, night stalk, a growing from whom my eyes gain their teeth, become wide as you, your field, your open pasture.